Hello, everybody, and welcome to Save Us Family on the Block, where knowledge is power. I'm your host, Jason, and joining me today is Erica Friday. Hello, Erica. Hi, Jason. It is so good to have you here. I was had the privilege of attending one of Erica's uh, workshops online just last week and was so impressed I wanted to have her on here immediately to talk to all of you. So let's start with, um, instead of me saying secondhand what you're all about, why don't you, could you tell our people a little bit about what you're doing and how you got there and why you're doing it? For sure. So my background is actually as a writer and a creative director. And with that background, I have a, a deep set of skills in project management and people management. And when I became a mom, specifically when I became a mom of two, I was floored by how hard I found it to be. Um, and I had to go like through the valley of doubt before I came out the other end. And what helped me up to the other end was yes, therapy, and also drawing on the skills that had brought me so much success in my career. And that was being really organized, putting systems in place. And also, and this is where the people management part comes in, um, knowing myself, knowing my limitations, knowing my desires, getting my needs met, and putting that all together was the birth of my company, Ready, Set, Moms. Now, why would someone with that background be talking to you and your audience today? Well, one of my projects that I'm launching right now is called Ready, Set, Emergency Prep. So I bring all of that to the very important project of emergency preparedness for families. And I think that's that. And the magic word is emergency preparedness. Yeah. So I immediate, a lot of us, I think, immediately think about, wonder where your bunker is um, and, and wonder why you haven't already shown us your gun collection. Now, it's my understanding from your presentation that that's not what you're about at all. So could you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, I say I'm not a prepper, I'm a mom. And what's important to me is feeling and being safe. And how I define that is it starts with me in my own mindset and skill set, then ex it expands to my family and my home, and then it expands beyond that to my neighborhood and my community. And it expands beyond that to this country and the society that we're living in. So if that is my value-based premise, that does not entail bunkers and ammo. That entails having enough to sustain ourselves so that we're not drawing resources from the community. And it means having enough to support those around us who might have needs. So that's not a very common um, paradigm in preppers, but that's what works for me. And that's what works for the students that I teach. You mentioned that in your presentation. And I, I like that approach where you had these kind of three tiers of preparedness, starting with survival, just keeping you and your family safe, moving to comfort, and then finally out to community and helping with the, with the community or region, depending on the kind of disaster you're talking about. And I think that yeah, I call, I call those the readiness standards. Are you going for a survival standard? And that's probably what you'd get if you buy one of those red backpacks or if you donate to public radio and they send you one of those kits. And it's gonna have like a brick of calories that you're not gonna wanna eat, but if that's what you need to survive, okay, you've got that. Um, and then above that is a comfort standard. And that doesn't necessarily mean like your furry slippers. It means having food that tastes good and that your children will eat. It means having clothes that will keep you warm, having shoes that will keep you safe while you're doing the work. So that's the comfort standard. And then beyond that is the community standard where you are, like I said a moment ago, you have enough capacity, both energetically and in terms of your supplies to support the people around you. So in my uh, packing list, my shopping list that I give people, there's a gigantic box of granola bars. Maybe you'll eat those all yourself, but also if people are walking by, you can be like, here, take some of these. Mm -hmm. A granola bar, um, bottle of water, and yeah. any more. If, if you go to those, if you really want to get into the community help thing, and you go to those, the brand, what is it? The Brandon Merchandise um, imprint stores. You can now get little charging bricks with your logo on them for like a buck 50 a unit. And so I can imagine in say a blackout or a major winter storm, mm -hmm. handing people a bottle of water or granola bar and a fully charged charging stick. The whole pack that. of 
five bucks, that could, that would be immense goodwill and a lot of karma. That's amazing. I also want to add that not everybody needs to prepare to the utmost standard. Perhaps the survival standard is enough for you to feel and be safe. But even that does help your community because you are, um, you're going to talk about it. You're going and you might spark the idea of emergency preparedness in somebody else. And if you are safe and you can take care of the people that are close to you, you're not going to draw the emergency services away from the rest of the community. Mm. And if you're more security mindset, because you know the bunkers and the guns aren't, it's a big part of the prepper community, and I think. Uh, it gets more attention, but in major disasters, there are leaders, there are issues. But if you're taking care of your own survival, you're not out in the world asking for help, drawing mm. attention to people either. Mm. So on both sides, that's, that's, it's good. Yeah. It's a good practice to be survival ready. Now, another thing that you mentioned in your, in your workshop that I really appreciated was that, you know, a question that a lot of people would ask at this point is, okay, so what's my list of stuff? How much, what, what, what's my stock to list for my pantry? Yeah. But you, you made the very good point that, well, I have to answer that question. I have to ask, where do you live? What are the emergencies that are going to happen where you are? Yes. Before you know what you need, you know, you have to know what you're up against. And I would think about that in terms of what's likely a high likelihood, a low likelihood, or no likelihood, like if you're living in Florida, you don't need chains for your tires. And then the impact, how grave would the impact be if an, if an earthquake happened tonight and we have not made preparations? It'd be pretty great. So is the impact high or low? When you take into account the likelihood and the impact, that helps you focus where you wanna start your efforts. That feels very much like the old Stephen Covey um, urgent important grid, right? Mm -hmm. Is it urgent and important? Is it urgent or important? You've got the same thing, the four quadrants. Yeah. Back in likelihood. And um, while I think that is a really valid approach to prioritizing, mm -hmm. it might overwhelm some people. Mm. So there are different ways in. You could go, you could say, okay, I want to get emergency ready. How could I start? And I just told you a little bit about impact and likelihood. Another way in would be what's easiest. Mm -hmm. If you start with a very simple action and you check it off your list, you've just proven to yourself, you've told your brain through your actions that you are a person who's going to get this work done. And that's highly motivating. And the fourth way in is fear. If there's something that scares you the most, even if it may not be that likely, by attacking that fear head on, writing it down on paper, writing out your plan about how you're going to approach it and get yourself risk ready, then you've taken the biggest worry off your head and you have more capacity to deal with anything else. Yeah, and I really appreciate that approach where you're, it doesn't matter whether you do the, you know, the, the little grid and do a really strong analysis or whether you do the thing that's just that you can get done today while you're shopping yeah. or whether you approach the thing that scares you most all three of those are valid what's important is that you do something you do something yeah. today and this week even if it's a small thing you know picking up an extra flat of water at the grocery store can make a difference and it's something that you did and that's yes. there's this falling effective empowerment that goes with any kind of action like that Yes, let's take water as an example. People can stop themselves from taking action because they're afraid of getting it wrong. It's a, it's a version of perfectionism. So you can get down the rabbit hole of researching, how much water do I need? What's the best way to store it? What's the best place to store it? Should I get iodine tablets? Should I get those emergency straws where you can drink out of a muddy puddle? Um, should I get those bricks where I have to treat the water? And then how often do I need to rotate them? Should I get those cans? Should I learn how to take water out of my hot water tank or the back of the toilet? And it's just like, <laughs> like you said, maybe you just buy an extra flat of water, put it on the shelf, and then you can take a methodical approach to that research and come up with what will be good, better, best along the way. It does not need to be perfect to keep you safe. Mm. And again, kind of circling back to those standards of preparation where 
if you get survival ready, which only takes a week and not much, really, um, you, know, you literally add 50 bucks to your uh, shopping trip once a week for a month and you can have a week's worth of supplies. Um, and once you're survival ready, then you have the luxury to research a little more deeply, uh, get to comfort ready, you know, and comfort yeah. ready really can be something as simple as you take your survival gear, you add a couple of space blankets and a coloring book and a board game. Yes, you got it. Too. And then all of a sudden you're feeling pretty comfy, especially if you're um, bugging in versus bugging out. Yeah. A friend of mine had a business where she specialized in creating earthquake kits for clients. It was this white glove service. And one of her clients wanted a case of Lule Blanc, that specialty wine. That's <laughs> like, that is what she wanted. That was her level of comfort standard. And my <clears> friend was like, you got it. I will set that up for you. We'll figure out a way to store it. So you'll have it when you need it. <laughs> That's fantastic. Now on the top, you use those terms as well, but um, for the benefit of anybody watching who's not sure, the idea of a bug in situation or a bug out situation and the differences between those. Could you, could you address that a little bit? Sure. In my framework, there are two major circumstances. Are you going to shelter in place? And that might be without access to food or water or power or um, communication or utilities. So like shelter in place under certain circumstances or evacuate. And then for either one of those circumstances, you're going to need three things. You're going to need strategies, you're going to need skills, and you're going to need supplies. When people think about emergency readiness, they go straight to the supplies. What do I need to get? And I would impress upon people that what you need the most is actually the plan, the strategies. That comes first. The, that situational awareness and that forethought is going to protect you much more than stuff ever will. So your strategy comes first. And then your skills, do you know what to do? Do you need to learn anything to feel and be prepared? And then finally, that's where the stuff and the supplies comes in. Well, it seems like if you don't start with a strategy, you're not really gonna have a very um, on point supply list. And you're right. not gonna have a great list of skills to go get. Right. My girlfriend, um, she bought her own flat in San Francisco. It was awesome. It was beautiful. And she showed me her emergency bag, which she got from public radio. And I was like, let me take a look at this. I've never really seen one up close. And I opened it up and it had that brick and it had this pretty good, um, like hand cranked radio slash, um, like generator almost. Yeah. And she was like, oh, I don't even know how to use that. I'm like, okay. So when you're in a crisis, are you going to figure it out? Because you're not going to be able to go online and YouTube how this thing works or like how to set the dial. Um, so getting your, even if the, even if the best you can do today, because you've limited the time is to buy a pre-made kit and there's a wide variety and there are some really good ones. If the best you can do is buy one of those kits, you need to open it up. You need to touch everything that's in it. You need to see how it's organized. You need to think, okay, in X situation, what am I going to do? Because without that forethought, when the emergency comes, you're more likely to be panicked and you cannot make good decisions when you're panicked. Yeah, um, great expression of that that I heard is that me with the lights on, a full belly and a beard on my left is way smarter than me in the middle of an emergency. That's <laughs> Every, great. Um, you know, plan, rehearse your plan because a uh, plan you don't rehearse, it's not a plan, it's a wish. And then then you can be confident that when, the, if the time comes, you'll have the skills yeah. and the stuff. So if you wanna know what inspired me to start this work and Absolutely. getting my yeah. family emergency ready, there was this day in San Francisco a few years back um, when the sky glowed orange. We were in the middle of the pandemic, so our brains were a bit foggy and it had been like poor air quality. And then you woke up this day and I've never seen a color like this in nature before. Maybe like California poppies, that, that beautiful like orange yellow, but never in the sky. And nobody knew what was going on. So what I did was I just went through the motions of a normal morning. I got the kids on the bike and I drove them to, I rode them to school. And then when I got home, I was like, what the heck? This, this could have been nuclear fallout. This could have been an alien invasion. And what did I do? I just went through the motions of a normal morning. That told me that if an emergency strikes, I need to be able to rely on instincts and muscle memory 
that's smarter than that. I wasn't ready for emergency. I was going through the motions and the motions were not thoughtful. I think that's uh, one way that a lot of humans cope in a lot of stressful situations where they just kind of pretend that everything's okay. Yeah. And that initial um, acceptance that things can go wrong. Oh, crap. It looks like things are going wrong ahead of time. You know, in the crime yeah. prevention here, which is where my background is, that gap between when you saw the shady guy by your car in the parking lot and decided to walk to your car anyway with both hands full of stuff. Yeah. You know, that gets very close to victim blaming in some ways, but also there's a way to never be a victim if you're if you see that first sign of trouble. And this doesn't mean immediately go into full crazy mode, but it does mean, huh, just kind of give yourself a moment to go, hey, that's funny. Yeah. My mom calls that your brain trying to help you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Gavin DeBecker's gift of fear goes off, goes on in detail about how that's uh, what we call our intuition is actually us picking up on yeah. hundreds of little bitty pieces that we didn't put together consciously about that person's body language or the vibe yeah. of that. And that, you know, then we can go off on how uh, the school system and life in general basically programs that instinct out of us and tells us mm. it's appropriate to, <laughs> to act on that intuition. And then we need to spend mm. around getting over that. But the point being that in that moment, you saw a weird sky color. What was that? Was that forest fires or? That was wildfire nearby. And then San Francisco's famous marine layer. Yeah. And it just hit in this way that it sustained that glow for hours. I don't remember if it lasted all day or what, but it was, it was weird. Yeah. That was the, we had that up here during the same season and we had actual asphalt like snow in August, which was, yes. Although our garden did really well the next year because ash is an amazing fertilizer. <laughs> Who knew? But there it was. Who knew? Yeah. I'm going to look for a picture for you where we have, um, yeah. So where were, where were we? Here, so you were talking we a little bit about what inspired you to take, oh yeah. So there's the ash on the car. There's a van here across the street from our house where somebody was living. The sky was that color. I'm wearing a mask because of COVID. And it's yeah. just like, what is this world we're living in? Yeah. Cause yeah. Huh. it doesn't feel okay. No, no, that is scary. Yeah. You're, um, you're, you're in Central Oregon now, and I've spent much of my early life in Central Oregon, which is wildfire fire central and has been yes. before things got a little nuts. And yeah, so that's that is a sky color a lot of us are familiar with up there, and it is does mean it's time to make take some steps. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you're talking about how you got onto this journey about getting more serious about prepping, and so what my next my next question is: What was the most surprising thing you learned while you started researching this topic? Whatever your nature is in approaching a challenge is going to show up in emergency prep. So if you tend to go down a rabbit hole of research, that's going to show up. So have the mindfulness to be able to pause and say, do I need this to be perfect or do I need this to be done? And depending on the likelihood and the impact, you can make that decision. So when it comes to the water, you want to get it right about how much water you want to have access to, but the exact how maybe doesn't matter as much. Another way to be prepared for emergency is through estate planning, making sure everything's in order in case the, you and or your partner should pass away, leaving your children behind. Now that is something that is both, I would say, urgent and important to get done right. So based on my research and my experience in the world, I think it's important to go through an estate planning attorney and draft this in a very thoughtful, values-based, all tied up kind of way. Somebody else with different, different inputs, whether that's how much money they want to spend on it, or how serious they think it has to be, might choose a more DIY approach, finding a way to, to build their estate plan using free software. So that's just another example of 
Do I want to get it done or do I want to get it perfect? And then how do I move on from that decision point? Yeah, and as you say, making sure that it's the right solution for your family and your situation. You know, if you've got, yeah. you know, a corporate lawyer with a few million dollars in assets spread out in bank accounts, yeah. in countries and three homes is going to need one solution. <laughs> there's other folks who are like, buddy, the house is underwater, but there's a $10,000 worth of Krugerrands buried in the backyard. It's under the cherry tree. Yes. That might be the entirety of their estate planning. But whatever it is, <laughs> you need to make sure that that's it, right? It depends who you are and what's going on. Yeah. But that's, you need to, on, and this gets back to emergency prep in general from that and everything where you start with that honest assessment of where you are and what you need and uh, what the difference between those two things is. <laughs> yes, and that's what I teach in my program. I don't just give you a list and say, this is what you need because I don't know you. I don't know your circumstances, your needs and your preferences and the risks that you face, but I can give you the framework and the scaffolding and this like categorical approach to planning that will help you get to the level of risk readiness that you need. And I think anybody that's selling a list and says that they have all the answers is doing a disservice. No, I, I absolutely agree. And it's, it's a, to, this has been something while I've been doing the show and talking to safety experts in a lot of different um, disciplines, I've started calling it the context gap, where you have this expert who approaches and says, well, here's what you need. And what they're often saying is, well, here's what I need. Because that's their experience in their context, where the other person's experience and their context is very different. A really visceral example to me is the number of women's self-defense classes that are taught by a six foot two, 240 pound former Marine who's now a law enforcement officer. That guy's self-defense context is so different from a portably sized college graduate woman, <laughs> right? From everything from the, the raw, um, the laws of physics governing the sizes of the bodies to the kind of crimes yeah. victim of, to the way they need to be aware. It's just so different that they almost have no sense. So like you say, any expert who just gives you a one-size-fits-all fits all list, it doesn't mean they're not an expert, but it does mean they haven't been thinking about you as much yes. as they yes. follow their advice. Right. You are the expert at, in you. So what can you take from them and apply them to your own circumstances? I love your term context gap. And that, that goes back for, to, for me to why I built my business. When I became a mom, my role models were my mother and my sister who can handle anything. They're like, um, no stress ever. And like these parenting books were like, here's how to be unruffled. And I'm like, I'm ruffled. <laughs> Your advice isn't helping. And what I learned over the years was like, my mother is fully pragmatic and capable and she literally can handle anything without sweating. I am much more sensitive and my needs are different than hers. So my expression of motherhood has to be different than her expression of motherhood. So the way that I approach coaching parents is the same way that I approach emergency preparedness. You, number one, know yourself. Number two, know your kids. So number three, you know what to do. That's it. That solves everything. And now I'm out of business. And I, I would very much insert a one sub A of uh, forgive yourself for the ways that who you are isn't who you want to be or who you were incorrectly taught was how you have to be. Yeah. yeah. I think a lot of people get spun up in there and then never move on to steps two, three, two and three because they're stuck there. And I think that leads to a lot of perfectionism that prevents progress. You're right. Let, let's pause and put a point on that. Accept who you are and what your situation is, and then you can work with it. And even if you're not happy with who you are, if you're doing something every day, every other day to kind of get to where you want to be, yeah. revel in that decision. That makes you braver yeah. than of humanity. Yeah, nice. So uh, before we go, I do want to ask, when, we, when I saw your presentation, when we talked last week, you have a program coming up like imminently. That yeah, sounds I do. Of, and I'm sure that if folks, if you're watching this six months from now, I'm, I'm pretty sure she's going to do it more than once. But could you tell us about your program? What's what you got going on? I'd love to. It's a 12 week program where we get your family risk ready. Everything that we've talked about today in that framework and that customized approach to make sure that 
you get the skills, the strategy, the skills, and the supplies that you need to get yourself risk ready. If people want to read more about it, they can go to readysetmoms.com slash emergency prep, and you can see all about the modules and how we do the work together and the bonus sessions. We have some great expert speakers coming in. The bonus sessions themselves are just priceless. We have one on estate planning, one on fi financial fundamentals for financial security, and another panel discussion with some great um, healthcare and mental health providers where we talk about the things they've seen and the things that they wish that people knew for accident prevention and response. Fantastic. And uh, when does that launch this time around? The doors are open now and it's going to be launching like mid February. Okay, excellent. Excellent. This post should be dropping on Thursday, February 2nd. Awesome. So watching this live, or, or you know, if you're watching it as it drops, there's still time to get involved. Uh, Definitely. You mentioned that panel discussion. I'll go ahead and um, mention our very first episode, which I might, might encourage you to send to some of your folks, was an interview with. At this point in his career, he was in the captain in charge of medical response for San Francisco International Airport. Wow. He'd, he'd been a, a medic and a paramedic for his entire career. And the prep for that was I just said, hey, buddy, uh, what are like 10 things that parents can do or do less often so you see their kids less in your professional capacity? And he's able to just, these things, awesome. these 10 things. <laughs> if parents stopped doing these 10 things, I would never have to treat another kid again. Amazing. I'll check and, that out fabulous list and it sounds like this uh panel is going to be very similar with folks saying man if you guys would just stop sitting your coffee down within reach of the baby yes. seat yes I, I would love it guys that kind yes. of thing that is well erica thank you so much for coming on the show today uh before we go what's the really smart question i should have asked but i didn't oh golly um certainly don't ask me what my favorite music is because you just made my mind blank um <laughs> What's the really smart question you should have asked but didn't? Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's a question about women doing this work. Because mm. you see a lot of preppers, it's a pretty masculine space. Mm. And if you see women in the space, it's kind of those masculine dudes, ladies. Um, yeah. that, that's not my style. Bless them and keep them, but <laughs> I have a different way. So when I speak to like the gender norms on this topic, I would say play to your strengths. So we, I play to the gender norm of, I do all the food in this family. I do the meal planning and the grocery shopping and the cooking, and that's what I do. So in this household to play to my strengths, I would be the one taking care of all the food that goes into the emergency kits. And my husband, who's the more mechanically inclined, he maybe would be the person to take care of all the gear. But don't stop there. You need to play to your strengths and also stretch yourself. So I need to give my husband a tour of all the food and the rationale behind it and how I imagine us deploying it. And he would need to give me a tutorial about all of these tools and how they're organized and how he imagines we would deploy it. And this comes back to, you need to touch and be aware of everything that goes into your emergency kit because preparing for the emergency is practice for the emergency. Mm -hmm. um, I got myself a multi-tool from REI. I love it. That's what every mom needs um, like from her baby shower, not more diapers. She needs a multi-tool because this thing is so handy. So I got my multi-tool and I got it out and I was trying to figure it out. And I could not figure out how to close the knife. Mm. And it was not on the packaging and I couldn't find it on you. So I was like looking at this thing every which way I set it down. I walked away, I came back and then etched ever so slightly is this um, picture of a lock. So you mm -hmm. have to press this and then you can send the whole thing down. Now, if I'm again in an emergency and I'm panicked, I'm not going to be able to figure out how to close the gosh darn knife. So again, plug for practice. And I, the assigning roles to everybody is so important as well. And this is right out of the professionals page for our safety experts, um, civic emergency planning, bodyguards, security of all kinds that mom's got a job, dad's got a job, mom's got a job and mom's got a job, dad's got a job and dad's got a job, whatever your family yeah. possibly has to be, each child has a job and everybody knows everybody else's job and having that worked out ahead of time. 
Yes, and. Yeah. What if one of those important players is incapacitated? Yeah. So or just everybody. Out- right. Right. What if what if one of those people is off tending to something? Yeah. Um, so every everybody needs to stretch their skills, and yeah. there are very easy ways to practice um, training those muscles. Like in the example that I gave in our household, I need to pay, hang the pictures more often. I need to fix the toilet more often. I need to be the one driving on family outings more often. So my husband's the one handing back snacks and helping everybody manage. We need to play to our strengths because that's how we can live efficiently and also joyfully. Yeah. And we also need to stretch ourselves um, to expand what we're capable of and make ourselves even more risk ready. Absolutely. And that, that gets to that point you were making about, you know, you make your plan and then you assess the skills that you need and then the stuff that you need. Yeah. Uh, it's time to, while we're, while we're assessing things, when was the last time we took medical training beyond the half day first aid certification we had to get to get that job when we were in college? Yes. Um, or when my uh, first child was six months old. Yeah. Do we know how to change a tire? When was the last time we changed a tire? Do we know how to use the most recent generation of Jack? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's that list? You know, do we, do we know how to, to walk to grandma's house with the current, Good one. Um, with, you know, with the current uh, geography of your area, all those skills like you're talking about, but, and Erica, you're going to go into a lot of that stuff in your course. And there's a lot of resources already on your website, readysetmoms.com. Now, is that just the three words or are there hyphens or anything in there? Readysetmoms.com. Perfect. Well, thank you again. Erica, for coming on today. Thank you, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next time. Stay safe. Bye for Thank now. you, Jason. This was a real pleasure. Bye-bye.